it's my passion, but it's also my passion to inspire people worldwide to do Ikebana and if it's possible guide them through the Ikebana philosophy and how do I do that? Most of you know through my free weekly newsletter but I teach also uh, classes in person. I teach through Zoom classes and videos, I give workshops and I publish books and it's for the book we are here so it's a promotion for my second book but first let's start with the first one so uh, about six years ago the Belgian publisher Stichting Kunstboek asked me if I was interested in making uh, an Ikebana book but an easy hands-on Ikebana book accessible for a broad public. And that's how Exploring Ikebana was created. And so it was also a direct fit with our philosophy. So we were very excited to make this first book, Exploring Ikebana, step by step. It's a little bit like the schools. When you follow Ikebana with whatever school, the, uh, they have all a curriculum. And as a, when you just start, then you copy basic arrangement. And through the basic, you learn techniques and aesthetics. And with my first book, it's a little bit like that. So you really can copy the arrangements in this book and along the way you learn some techniques and you maybe are encouraged to, uh, to go further on and search for a teacher. And then you go further and find your own style and art. In, uh, at the end of 2019 the book was sold out and the publisher asked us if we were interested, if the book was reprinted and to make a new one. And for this new one, we were uh, completely free to choose the team. And we uh, did a different approach. But inspiring Ikebana, it's about how my creative process works. And also the sharing and teaching is a big part of this process. So I share a lot of knowledge without holding back. And by that, it trains my mind to constantly come up with new things. And when we were writing this book, we came along uh, a saying from John Cleese, the actor of Monty Python, that creativity is not a talent. It's a way of uh, operating. And then in the first chapter of my book, I explain how it works for me, how I get inspired, how I find uh, ideas and how the creative process works. But I give also tips on how you can be inspired. And then in the ch uh, next chapter, oops, just going through it, I uh, explain a little bit from what is Ikebana and my view on Ikebana. And then probably most important is the following seven chapters. It's about uh, all the arrangements, all together 40 arrangements. And they are by what was my inspiration source. So in the book I covered nature, seasons, festivals, Vasons and containers, artificial materials, art, mood and feelings. Of course, there are many more sources, but then uh, probably you have a book you can't uh, carry anymore and it gives me more uh, ideas for the next book. But uh, today I want to show you some examples of... Uh, things that inspired me the last few weeks. So let's stop talking and 
let's start a short uh, demonstration with uh, inspiring Ikebana arrangements. For my first arrangement, I am uh, inspired by nature. So nature, I think, is the biggest inspiration source because yeah, we are working with uh, living plant material and uh, you go out and there's many beauty to see in nature when you walk, when you take a walk. And depending where you live, your, uh, the way how you are inspiration and the way how you use your plant material can be also very different. And that makes in Kibana so interesting lately because, yeah, all over the world it's practiced, but nature is also different all over the world. And here now it's uh, win still winter, but we have already not this week because it was snowing and freezing cold. But before this week and probably next week, we have the end of spring already. And one of the trees which are uh, plenty available in Belgium is uh, willow, salix. And that's what I'm going to work with for my first arrangement. So I have these very beautiful uh, willow branches and the first thing I'm going to do is uh, look how they uh, are shaped and uh, oh, I think we have a problem. My head is uh, off. Murphy slow. <laughs> so the first thing I do is uh, looking at uh, my uh, branches and uh, like you can see they are really lovely red catkins. And for this arrangement, I want to make a, a very natural It's really thick and hard so. It's a little bit heavy. I'm going to wait with this one. It was there. Could you mention one more time which um, branch you're using? Salix Willow. And is it any particular kind of salix or just a generic salix? Uh, yeah, this is just... Uh, it's not the salix alba, but I have to look up which uh, scientific second name it has. But uh, it's, it's not, uh, for here at least, not an exotic salix. And does it require any specific care when you're cutting? Do we have to cut this one under water? No, it's uh, willow. It's are very easy plants. Uh, don't have to cut it under water. It's uh, it's hard. It's uh, 
strong. There is a saying, I don't know if you know it, there is nothing so easy as a willow. But in Dutch it sounds a little bit funnier and <laughs> And also normally it let it's easy to bend. So when, uh, for the ones where uh, willow is also very common, most of the time it's uh, growing wild and uh, in uh, places where you have uh, also wet grounds. View. I want to bend this. Uh, bend so it. Sorry, could you explain what sort of bending you're doing at the moment? So now I'm trying to have a nice flow, a natural flow of the willow, like I can uh, find here in Belgium. And so I did a controlled breaking here, so I could bend this uh, branch here a little bit more. Okay. And now, because the willow, it's something which is uh, flowering early at the middle or the end of the winter, I'm going to combine this with uh, Helleborus. This is a flower at this moment flowering in Belgium. So that's why I'm combining it with the willow. So hellebore, it's uh, sometimes a bit difficult to use in an arrangement. But I discovered if uh, you cut it regularly, so in an arrangement it happens sometimes that after uh, one or two days the flower gets tired and uh, can't have or oh, doesn't drink water up until the flower head. Then take it out and cut it once more under water and you see in 15 minutes or 30 minutes later 
it's vivid again. Because it's, it's really a very beautiful uh, flower, and especially in winter, nice to use. Because it's, it's an, um, here a garden plant, so if you plant it in the garden, or even in a pot on the terrace, it's possible. So even the leaves you can use. Okay, I will stand aside. This is uh, my first arrangement, inspired by nature and also about how wild uh, the sometimes a willow can grow here, but under the willows, uh, winter or uh, spring flowers are flowering, and this is my inspiration. So I will clean up and then we go to the next one. If you have questions, I think uh, Louise is helping you answering your questions. For my second arrangement, we stay in nature and now we go to spring and in springtime the first thing what flowers here in uh, not only this but uh, what's very remarkable is forsythia because it's so yellow and uh, when I was a child we had one in front of the kitchen and it was always as if uh, even on a grey day, and the forsythia was in full bloom, it was as if the sun was shining. And these branches, they come, I cut them out of uh, my father-in-law's garden, I think three weeks ago, so they were not yet in bloom. I had made already with this branch an arrangement, but it started to flower here, and I thought, let's make it also in another arrangement. So this is, spring is my inspiration, but I'm going to do something more with it. Sometimes, uh, so you learn in, uh, in your school certain ways on how to fix it in a vase, but Afterwards, you can uh, try out other fixation methods or you derived from the one you learned and you do it a little differently. So in Sohetsa, there is a cross fixation, but I didn't make a cross fixation in this phase. I just made a horizontal bar but I made an opening in it. So there are schools uh, who have this type of uh, fixation as their main 
fixation method. But because of the shape of this uh, branch, I thought it interesting to use also this method. It's uh, like you can see quite long, so I'm going to cut from the bottom and from the top just a little bit. So now it's a little bit too long. A little bit shorter. Lisa, can you explain perhaps why you consider that to be too long and your view of what the dimensions should actually be, that what makes a good length an appropriate length in an Ikebana arrangement? So normally, when you start to learn, then you always take your vase as starting point. So the, there are certain measurements you learn while uh, learning Ikebana. So in Sogetsu you have a regular measurement, for example, is the height, the diameter of the vase plus half. But you can go smaller and you can go longer. So you can, even in a small vase, you can go very long if that's what you want to emphasize on. Here, I re uh, indeed, I want to go for length, but it went completely out of your eye view. So, and when that's the case, then it's too long or you have to go onto the other hand of the room to view your complete arrangement. Is that your goal? Then you, indeed you can very long. But if you place it somewhere in a room, in a normal room, and you go too long and you never notice the part, the tall part, so then it's not necessary, then you just cut it and that's here the case so it was really very long and you don't notice it anymore uh. so just one more question about your crossbar fixation yes <laughs> and what's the question Oh, so um, there was a question with regards to there being a hole in your crossbar fixation. And could you ex please explain why do you have a hole in it? And did you also use forsythia for your crossbar? No, I used, because forsythia branch is hollow. And then if you cut it, it uh, it's not strong anymore. So that's why I used, uh, because I have it here, cornus. And what I did, it's uh, like a regular cross fixation, but only one. And I made, like you do for upright fixation, I made a slit. And then when it's a uh, upright fixation, then you put your branch also in it. But now I use this horizontal, not vertical, but horizontal and opened it. So maybe when, if it works, it will come closer with, uh, with the camera and then uh, you can see what's happening. And the reason why I do this, because I want to keep the vase free so that it's really rising out of the vase. Okay. Then inside. So I will come closer with the camera. You see, this is what uh, 
happened. So it's like, oops, I'm trying. It's a fork, and inside the fork is uh, is the branch. And now I'm adding a second one to create the feeling of the sun. For CCI is also very difficult to bend, but I'm going to try just a little bit. And now, together with Forsythia, because they flower together, I'm using tulips. And it's Valentine, so there are many red flowers. So that's why I'm using red tulips. I'm playing a little bit with the leaves because I don't want to cut them off all. Ah, okay, and I'm going to fill this completely with water. Ah. Can I have water? Yeah. And by using this technique, you, even in a tall vase or a taller vase, you can uh, emphasize also on uh, the opening and the water and then your arrangement rising out and yellow and red in contrast. So this is my spring inspiration. And for the next one, I'm inspired by the artist uh, Mondrian, but not for his colors. This time, it's uh, Mondrian did much more than uh, only colorful uh, paintings with uh, primer colors. He has also uh, 
a series about uh, Peer and the ocean. He made them when he was living in, uh, on the coast in the Netherlands and he looked every day out of his window onto the seashore and that was an inspiration for a couple of uh, paintings. And when I looked at the paintings, I saw all these. And so that the idea inspired me to make an arrangement in the book and another one, so my own series of uh, inspired by Mondrian arrangement. And I used uh, cornice branches To, to make this and like I said I uh, the painting when you really look at it he made this object with uh, all he drew all little teeth or that's how it looked to me and that's what I did here so I cut the cornice branches in irregular pieces and made all this. But the thing is, of course, living material dries out, so you have to tie them together, wire them together very well. So um, it might be beneficial if you actually move, come a bit closer to the camera so that we get a better shot of you actually wiring okay. and making the tea. In, the, in my book, how to wire, it's, uh, I think, very well explained. So the ones who have already the book, uh, you have definitely have to look it up. It's step by step. I explained how you can uh, make a very secure uh, wiring. So I go in across first under, then I come back like this. Then you turn and then very tight. So when it, the wire is uh, flexible, then you can turn it around and it will, uh, you see, you can't almost move it anymore. And then you cut. Oh, it's already. And this is, and then now I do and more and then you get an idea how this is constructed like this and then you can uh, add somewhere you're changing uh, view <laughs> yeah and then I add 
and I built on and on. So this is small, long, but you can go wide. So in the book, there is an example that uh, really have, I think, almost one meter in diameter, an arrangement, just floating uh, teeth all bind together. You can use it like this. This or you can add a flower and tulips, when you buy them, they come here always in a big packet. So I'm going to use uh, again a tulip, red and green, always beautiful. Uh, I have in here a cross fixation and then there is one longer branch in on the on the cross fixation so that it's of course it needs to hold I go a little bit shorter Just a red uh, point in the middle. Like this. So this with or without the flower that you can choose yourself. Okay. So this is how you can be inspired by another artist and make your own idea and create something uh, different. So I clean up and then for the next one is something that I do already for many years. It's uh, one of the lessons in, uh, in the curriculum, in the Sogetse curriculum, is uh, intertwining green material. And from the moment I learned or I had did that lesson in class, I found it it was, I was in love with it. With intertwining green material, I do a lot. Or I, in, in Japan, I used regularly uh, pandanus leaves. But when I came back to Belgium, uh, I started to use tifa leaves. And over the years, I, my intertwining tifa leaves evolved in uh, just uh, really easy and plain. So now I can really make very big arrangements and especially after I had visited the bamboo exhibition in, uh, in Paris where there were oh, such lovely sculptures all by, inter by, by intertwined bamboo. Of course I can't strip bamboo until what they did in the small strips and then start to intertwine. But I can do that with uh, the tifa leaves or with wood strips, which they sell here also in Belgium. But my tifa leaves is my uh, favorite. So now I'm, I can't show it from scratch because then uh, you have to stay here and I think until midnight. But uh, I started already and what's important to have is uh, cloth pins because we have only two hands and uh, 
you can't hold all the ends. So that's why cloth pins are very interesting. Need to clean up from the previous arrangement a little bit. So, cloth pins, very important. In my book, there is uh, also examples with uh, Tifa and how you, and it's explained how you can start. Uh, here, my starting point was this, uh, this is not the vase, it's normally to uh, put in a candle. But I put in a glass container to hold, uh, to have water. And I used the openings in the vase or in the candle holder and put in the tifa leaves and they are all in the water. And then I started to intertwine and I'm going to keep on intertwining. And this part probably I will keep open to add uh, flowers, but here I still have a big part or a long, long leaves and here also. So now I'm going to intertwine these ones. And the fun part is you never have can do twice the same. It's always something different. But that makes it interesting. Because when I started uh, weaving, I started out with two, making always first a flat uh, sheet surface and then made it into 3D. And now I always start almost directly in 3D. Oh, maybe. <laughs> so, and that's why cloth pins are necessary. <laughs> to have your hands free.
So, for example, this I will leave like this, the ends, because you don't have to intertwine everything very tight. But of course, there where you want to have the pattern, or you want to have them together, then you have to be careful that you, like with uh, when you're knitting, that you go under and fasten it so that it doesn't come loose. And what's also, Ben is now close by. If you can't go back, but you want to fixate it, then you can uh, make a slit, go through, and then it also keeps. Leave also like this. I'm turning around. Maybe here at the end, because here I have still a pin, I have to go and fasten the ends. This I'm going, they go also inside, so they stay put like this. And then see that you remove all the cloth pins, of course. And you can play with it if you like. Having a few extra coming out. To have it light, playful and alive. thinking which flowers I'm going to use. <laughs> Some maybe. I stick with the tulips for a moment. Because for the contrast
Elsa, just a quick question. Did yes. you actually pop water in the candle holder? Yeah, there's a glass vase inside. So I put the candle holder, it's with, full with holes, but I have put a glass vase inside. Uh, so the glass vase comes until here. And of course, there is water in the glass vase. And one more question about your structure. What sort of fixation did you actually have inside or did you just use the holes? I just used the holes. There is no fixation inside. Because it's, you see, there are small holes. So I slid the tifa through the, the openings. And then it's the weaving that actually keeps everything together. Indeed. And could you perhaps explain why you're placing the tulips where you're placing them? And as well as perhaps why you're placing as many tulips as you are? Uh, because if I had one, big uh, flower and maybe one big flower could be enough but now I want to have an amount of color inside that's why I put in a bit more tulips than probably you should do normally because the, my structure is quite big and dominant and inside on the side See, I want to have here the, uh, a red color and keep this free and open. And you also want to enhance the curve of the um, structure as well. Yes. And when you go with your finger over the tifa, you can make uh, it in a playful uh, shape. I'm going to change the direction a little bit. And it's, a, it's quite a bit of work, but uh, you can enjoy it for a long time and even it uh, dries out nicely. It uh, becomes, uh, after a while, grayish. So you can play with uh, your structure later on also. Can we keep it in one direction? Okay. So this is uh, how I play with uh, intertwining and make uh, 3D shapes and they are always different and fun to do. So they had uh, two sources of inspiration just my uh, so hits a curriculum and the way how I enjoyed the exhibition of the uh, the bamboo ex exhibition but of course those bamboo intertwined objects they were marvelous <laughs> 
And if the tul or when the tulips die, would you um, replace them with another flower and keep the structure? Yeah, you can do that because uh, the structure will live, of course, much longer than uh, the tulips. And then uh, you place something else and it uh, looks completely different. And for an outsider, it can be that he it, uh, it thinks it's another arrangement. So I was just wondering, for participants that perhaps don't have taifa leaves where they live, are there any... Uh, you can... You can use uh, pandanus because you can make strips out of it also. That's what I, when I first started intertwining, I did it with, uh, in Japan, I did it with pandanus leaves or uh, New Zealand flax. It's also uh, very sturdy and good material and they come also very long. So that's also good material for intertwining. And even if you tear them in two or three pieces, they uh, dry out nicely. So then even if it's dry, you have still have your structure. And otherwise, it's any flexible material that which is sturdy enough to do it. So here in Belgium, I use or tifa or wood strips. So when you have the book, you will see examples with wood strips. Oh, for my oh, palm sorry. leaves might be appropriate, or would palm leaves be slightly too um, strong a material? Uh, I think that that's quite difficult because you have a certain length, and uh, they are on the stem. So I don't know you. You have to try, I think. I, I have never done it with palm leaves, just with yeah, two palm leaves and intertwined them a little bit, but uh, not with, uh, with many. Because also here it's uh, not the material I have readily, I, commonly at hand. So if you are in a country more tropical and palm leaves is what is available right away, just try it out. That's the best way to get inspired and to, to find new things. For uh, my second uh, arrangement, Oh no, my second, my fifth, I'm sorry. <laughs> For I wanted to say my next arrangement. It has also uh, many source of inspiration. A couple of weeks ago, we had an online sake tasting and we received some bottles of, small bottles of sake, but they were, uh, very colorful, very beautiful. And when they came out of the box, the first thing I told Ben, I said, oh, they are so nice to make an Ikebana arrangement. They will become an Ikebana arrangement. And uh, especially also the cover. I hope you can see it. It's, uh, it's colorful. It's very nice. So the, so here, and that's why I didn't take it off and I kept it. So the bottles, the sake tasting was my first inspiration source. And doing now at this moment in the year, my uh, book promotion, it's also the weekend of uh, Carnival. And Carnival is about, uh, yeah, alcohol in many countries, but also about uh, colors, happiness. And that's why I thought seeing all the colors on this uh, paper, I thought let's uh, 
make it a colorful arrangement. And nowadays, when we order something, there is always something in the box when the box is bigger than what's inside. And often you get those, uh, normally it's white, is more, I don't know how you call polystyrene. them. Hmm? Polystyrene. Polystyrene. What's uh, as a filler in the box. And I colored with spray paint in the back, then uh, shaked it, and then everything gets uh, colored, a little bit of pastel color. And to make it playful, colorful, I'm going to work with steel grass and this colorful uh, polystyrene dots I have. <laughs> Steel grass, it's uh, very hard and sharp, so you can go easily through the polystyrene. I use just uh, spray paint I buy at a flower wholesaler. when you don't have the ends anymore you have to make a hole and then yeah you can go through it so Ilse when you sprayed the packaging peanuts inside the bag did you take them out then to dry or did you just leave them and you sprayed the peanuts whilst they were in the bag rather yes. than spraying the bag and then popping the peanuts inside. No. So what I do is uh, you put it in the bag, have your can, place your can inside, close it, spray really well, take the spray out, then this is full with gas and it's like a balloon, then you do like this and because there is paint and the paint is still wet everywhere, that's how you paint this. It's very easy and then you put it aside because it's, uh, you know, spray paint, it's very smelly, put it outside or somewhere where you don't come and after a couple of hours it's dry. So I did this yesterday to be sure that it's dry. <laughs>
And sometimes it comes out at strange places. <laughs> Falling my way. I want to have it your way. And also, are you using steel glass to put through the packaging peanuts? Yeah, yeah, it's steel glass. Because that's, uh, yeah, steel glass is strong. And very sharp, like you can see. <laughs> Sometimes you just can bend it a little bit. And so you can keep on playing and uh, put grass with and without. The, <laughs> the peanuts like uh, Louise calls them. Ah, that's the correct name. <laughs> Other people are also coming in peanuts. Peanuts. When you 
go from the bottom. You have to be careful that you don't make the hole too big. Also, what sort of base have you got under the sake bottles? It's is a, it a tray or is it something special? It's a, a die, a wooden die, like they call in Japanese, to, uh, to place up on top your ikebana arrangement. And did you buy that in Japan or did you buy that? Um, in the Netherlands. Somebody in the Netherlands made uh, of the... So it's a branch in the Netherlands. One of the members' husband made uh, a couple of, uh, of dice and then you could order them. Does he still make them or not? I don't know. I have to ask. I, I have no idea. <laughs> so we are almost there. <laughs> To have a die is also uh, very nice when you make a miniature ikebana. Then you can emphasize on your uh, little or tiny vases and your tiny green material. Could you describe how you're actually constructing this arrangement, perhaps with regards to space and line and movement? Yeah, what I'm trying as best as possible to have a flow. So that's why I keep, I don't know if you see it, after, afterwards we will make uh, pictures of the arrangement, but here I have made a bowl going so that everybody, everything goes out in that direction. So to have a movement like this and up and down, just uh, a playful uh, arrangement. And with the placement of your sake bottles, yeah, so the I've placement been... of space is quite important as well. Yeah. So you see, I have three, uh, I have four bottles, so it's even. 
but I've placed them uneven. So I may have made a group of three and a group, group alone. So even if it's an even amount of bottles, it still feels um, uneven because of three and one. Uh, it's like uh, when I'm a, when I was uh, learning Japanese way of uh, designing gardens, with stones is the same. It's uh, you never use an equal amount of stones in one group. You also work every time uneven, but it can be that like you like here, you have. Uh, composition with three and close by you have one alone and it's with that idea that I have placed uh, those four bottles. And even in the composition of three I can see that the bottles aren't evenly spaced that there's more space like ma or negative space between two of the bottles and yeah. less negative space between two of the other bottles. Yeah, yeah, and it's when you go around, then there is uh, also a difference when you come and see it from another side. So those are those three, they are placed in a triangle. And then it's okay. So this is the other side. So from all sides, you have a different uh, feeling. And do you think that within the Sorgetsu curriculum that this might be something that's also, for example, to be viewed from all around? Uh, yeah, this can be. When I, maybe I should keep on heading and where, because I was thinking on, uh, because you are also playful, adding some uh, yellow garbras and if I put them facing in all directions, then you can see it in, uh, in all directions. So I will add a few, so you get an idea. I think this is also fun to do with, uh, with children. Because they love to work very col colorful. And sometimes Ikebana doesn't need to be too serious. And with this arrangement being inspired by Carnival, is there anything in particular that happens in Belgium during Carnival? Ah, oh, yeah. We have, uh, normally it's from, it had been in several cities from Friday evening until Wednesday morning before, um, yeah, we call it as Wednesday. I don't know it in, in English how it's called. Uh, I think it might be Ash Wednesday. Yes, <laughs> starts. So the last people, not this year of course, but normally the last people going out home is on Wednesday morning around six, seven o'clock. So in the most famous uh, carnival happening in, uh, in Belgium is in Alst. So it's also world, uh, how do you call it, world heritage? World <laughs> heritage. But it's not the same like uh, in, uh, for example, Brazil, there it's even more festive, I think. So would you say that it's almost like a big celebration prior to Lent as well? So it does have religious connotations as well to it. Uh, yeah. Carnival is as old as uh, there are people, but uh, it's also towards, first of all, it's to celebrate the coming of uh, spring. 
And then secondly, it became also often uh, a religious uh, event. Okay, so my uh, playful carnival arrangement, starting from, oh, I love these bottles, and then hmm, maybe this can be something for carnival. <laughs> and Ilse, perhaps could you explain why you've cut the gerberas um, at the length? that you've cut them rather than making them longer or even shorter? Uh, I wanted to have them under the, the volume of the peanuts and the grass because if I had them in between maybe you couldn't notice anymore if it were peanuts or the flowers so that's why I used the flowers uh, low near yeah, to the bottom. Also, if the stem is too long, they fall up. Yeah, and indeed, if uh, I keep the stem long, then, uh, and the bottles are very small, you see, then you almost don't see the yellow color of the garbras, because they are mini garbras, so they are not so big. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> so uh, are asking if there are more arrangements coming. Normally, I have prepared more arrangements, but it's up to you. If every yeah. if you vote that you want to see it uh, for uh, fifteen or thirty minutes longer, we can. And otherwise, I will have I will have one more to end. Of course, keep on going. So the next one has also a whole story. It's uh, inspired by a feeling, but it's not mine. It uh, was an, uh, an assignment from Els Goes. So I take uh, classes with her, but now it's also with uh, emails and pictures. And our assignment was big and delicate. And I had made one and had sent already the picture to her. But then I, have, uh, I had many other ideas. But by cleaning some boxes, I discovered two, uh, how do you say it? They are hmm? Dry, dried distals. So when you have a giant distal, it's uh, interesting in every phase of its, uh, of its life. And it's from, I think, three, almost three years ago. I did a little exhibition together with other members of our study group uh, at a vegetable museum. So they have a museum and outside a garden, but all with uh, herbs and vegetables. It's particular for uh, school children so that they can learn how and where and when vegetables grow. And we have made one time, and it was in autumn, arrangements with uh, things out of the garden that you can even with whatever what's growing there that you can make an arrangement. And there were also thistles still in bloom but also at the end of their uh, blooming, blooming and getting into the seed stage. And they were, when I used them, they were 
in the three stages, blooming, seeding. Uh, there's even, there were still some uh, buds. And for sure, it's big. But if you look at the seeds, and if you have seen my reel on the social media, it's also very delicate. When I took it out of the box, <coughs> my <coughs> sorry, it's um, the it's very plushy. <coughs> I think I have one in my throat. So when um, you uh, take off the real seed, then there is a little hole I discovered. And when you have thin wire, you can place this on wire. And that's what I did for this. I'm sorry, I'm going to have some water. So from there, you can't see it. So Ben, he comes with uh, the camera closer. So I, they are still inside. So I took them out. Now my finger is wet. Going for a few, you see, you can take them out one by one. Then this is the real seed, so that's why when you, it's uh, like a parachute, you will see it coming. <laughs> when it, the seeds are thin, then it's really very slowly, very nice. But that's what I took off. And then I don't know if it's visible. There is a little hole in the middle. Maybe if I show it by putting in wire. Oops. So, like this. broken one. Okay. So now I have three parachutes on the wi on the wire. And then I added them, but now we can come back to the, or you can change the position of the camera <laughs> to this. So Ben is going. The, the main view? No, with that, but a little, yeah. So you see, on the wire, I have all these little parachutes and just one seeded uh, distal. And it looks as if the wind takes away, like in real life. Ilse, okay. have you used one continuous loop of wire or are there several different lengths ah. of wire in there with the seeds on them? Yeah, they're really, there's not one long. It's uh, 
all uh, different pieces, different length, different amount of uh, parachutes, I'm going to call them. And uh, I just added them. A few come out of the distal bowl and then I intertwined very carefully, very, yeah, taking care of it that it doesn't uh, fall apart and then this is uh, the result. Another material I love playing with is uh, the catkins. And I had collected many. And again, I put them, like you can see, on wire. Oops. This is uh, also material I used in my book. It's, uh, it's really very nice to play with. When they are still on the branch, you can make uh, beautiful things. But the catkins on their own, they're also nice to play with. And then when I saw my frames, they were a little bit in the way and I thought maybe I can play once more with him with them and with the catkins uh, floating inside the frames. So often it is that you have a material, you work with it and you think hmm it's interesting, it's nice, but you have uh, more ideas or you want to improve your idea or the way how uh, you made your arrangement. You thought, oh, it's nice, but next time I like to do it this way or that way. So that's also Ikebana, making something, but the same material by making it can give you many other ideas and then you keep on using it, you keep on uh, making arrangements but every time differently or in another way and uh, that's fun to do. So I'm using light wire so that you almost don't see it. Ah, that's misschien niet ons dingen. Hmm? Misschien is dat bij Zoom. So yeah, uh, Ben is trying to solve the problem, but maybe it's uh, the internet itself or Zoom which uh, switch off the high D. Because we had high resolution for 19 minutes. wiring, making a string. <laughs> ah, somebody asked how I made this ball. So it's just wiring like you make a, a necklace. I wired all the catkins 
on a string and then you put them together until uh, they hold and they have a shape or a, a cloud. Oh, it's, uh, I'm going to make clouds. So in the past, if I made this, the structure, no. maybe you can explain. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you have to repeat the question. So uh, Ben told me that somebody uh, asked me if he made the structures. No, I am the one who is uh, crazy and built uh, all this. But the... The frames itself I bought at the wholesaler, at the flower wholesaler and I'm using them for all kinds of things and the fun part is that you can uh, with, uh, I added them together with tie, tie rips uh, but I balanced it. So now I have stones here because I'm working on it but normally I hope, yeah, it, uh, it holds, it should hold, yeah, <laughs> but as long as I'm working, I keep on the stones and I put it myself on uh, a little pin. I think also you said there was a small video that you posted on you yes. actually putting it together and making it. So if anybody wants to go to your Facebook page, they can actually see you, how you tied it all together and then cut the tie rips. Yeah, they were blue, so I painted them black because I have no black anymore. <laughs> and just a little bit more and then uh, we are finished. Is there a specific gauge um, wire that you use with the cat? Uh, two different, very thin one. I have no clue. Uh, maybe it's uh, three millimeters and one which is uh, five millimeters.
Okay, so it's a cloud or like a snow falling down in mass. And let's see if it's still in balance. It's still in balance. And if you like, you can always add uh, a flower. So if you add a bulb to it, you can add a flower. So let's see. Okay. So I will just show it. And then maybe afterwards, when we make pictures, can be an extra element to the arrangement. So, I'm sorry, I'm way over 90 minutes. I hope uh, you enjoyed it and that I could inspire you to look around, to be inspired with whatever uh, you see or you encounter. It can be, and it most is nature, but it can also be your teacher, your students. Uh, when you come together with your uh, study group or with friends and make Ikebana, you always inspire each other. And uh, everything you learn, you build on further on it. And then you make an interesting arrangement. And for the ones who are interested, uh, on the book, or because of the book, I will do also a couple of uh, workshops between uh, March and June, all inspired by the book. So who is interested can join the workshops and uh, be inspired by all the participants. So I hope you enjoyed it and uh, see you hopefully soon in real life. Thank you for watching.